The Children's Place is proud to support Reading Rainbow. A place to grow. The Children's Place. Reading Rainbow is also made possible by a ready-to-learn television cooperative agreement from the U.S. Department of Education through the Public Broadcasting Service and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is where you'll find me every other Friday, rain or shine, getting my hair cut. This is Mr. Johnson's Barbershop, and I've been coming here since, well, since I was about this high. Good morning, Mr. Johnson. Good morning, LeVar. Be with you soon. Okay, okay. In the meantime, help yourself to a peppermint, like you said. Now he's gonna tell me to just take one. Just take one, LeVar. Yes, sir. That's my barber. He gives this place a personality all its own. A barber shop isn't just a place where you get your hair cut. It's also a place where you can sit back, relax, and spend some time with someone you really like, your barber. My barber makes me laugh when she tells me funny jokes. You want to know what's neat about my barber? She's a woman. My barber cuts hairs like movie stars. Look at this one. My barber's name is Raul, and he speaks Spanish like I do. I was afraid of the barber at first, but now I like him. My barber's a special friend because she cut my mom's hair, and now she's cutting mine. I like my barber because he doesn't cut my ears. When I go in the barber shop, my barber asks me what I want, and I'm like, just the usual. I wonder if Mr. Johnson's got anything new to read. Uh, let's... Hey, look at this. This is one of my favorites. This is a story of a man who lived for the day when he could open his own barbershop. It's called Uncle Jed's Barbershop. Uncle Jed's Barbershop by Marguerite King Mitchell. Illustrated by James Ransom. Read by Regina Taylor. Jedediah Johnson was my granddaddy's brother. He used to come by our house every Wednesday night with his clippers. He was the only black barber in the county. Daddy said that before Uncle Jed started cutting hair, he and Granddaddy used to have to go 30 miles to get a haircut. After Uncle Jed cut my daddy's hair, he lathered a short brush with soap, spread it over my daddy's face, and shaved him. Mama wouldn't let him cut my hair, so he would run the clippers on the back of my neck and just pretend. He even spread lotion on my neck. I would smell wonderful all day. When he was done, he would tell me about the barber shop he was going to open one day and about all the fancy equipment that would be in it. The sinks would be so shiny, they sparkled. The floor is so clean, you could see yourself. He was going to have four barber chairs, and outside was going to be a big red and white barber pole. 
He told me he was saving up for it. He had been saying the same thing for years. Nobody believed him. People didn't have dreams like that in those days. We lived in the South, and most people were poor. Then, when I was five years old, I got sick. Mama and Daddy couldn't wake me up. They wrapped me in a blanket and took me to the hospital. We had to go to the colored waiting room. In those days, they kept black people and white people separate. It was called segregation. When the doctors did examine me, they told my daddy that I needed an operation and that it would cost $300. $300? My daddy didn't have that kind of money. Daddy went to find Uncle Jed and told him about me. Uncle Jed leaned on his bent cane and stared straight ahead. He told Daddy that the money didn't matter. He couldn't let anything happen to his Sarah Jean. Well, I had the operation. For a long time after that, Uncle Jed came by the house every day to see how I was doing. I know that $300 delayed him from opening his barber shop. Then, a few years after my operation, Uncle Jed came close to opening his shop again. One night, we had just finished supper when there was a knock on the door. It was Uncle Jed's friend with news that the bank where his money was had failed. Uncle Jed had over $3,000 in the bank, and now it was gone. Uncle Jed just sat there a long time before he said anything. Then he said that even though he was disappointed, he would just have to start all over again. Talk about some hard times. That was the beginning of the Great Depression. Nobody had much money. But Uncle Jed kept going around to his customers cutting their hair, even though they couldn't pay him. His customers shared with him whatever they had, a hot meal, fresh eggs, vegetables from the garden. And when they were able to pay again, they did. And Uncle Jed started saving all over again. All Uncle Jed finally got his barber shop. He opened it up on his 79th birthday. It had everything, just like he said it would. Big, comfortable chairs, four cutting stations, you name it. The floors were so clean, they sparkled. On opening day, people came from all over the county they were all Uncle Jed's customers. He had walked to see them for so many years. That day, they all came to him. Of course, I was there too. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. When I sat in one of the big barber chairs, Uncle Jed patted the back of my neck with lotion like he always did. Then he twirled me round and round in the barber chair. Uncle Jed died not long after that. And I think he died a happy man. You see, he made his dream come true even when nobody else believed in it. He taught me to dream, too. I'll be right there. It may have taken Jed a long time to get his shop, but he believed in his dream and he kept on trying. Here are four guys who had a dream and they used their voices to make it come true. I'm Jerry. 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 I'm
These four guys make up the singing group called the Persuasions. They started singing together on the street corners of Brooklyn. Oh, we are the Persuasion. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, there's a light that's from the window, and it shines down on the street. There's some guys standing on the corner there making some good old harmony. They sing a cappella which means they make music by just using their voices. Let them sing, let them dance, and make that good old harmony. We've been together right now. We've been together, we're going on 33 years. We've been together 33 years, and uh, it's been uh, it's been really wonderful. Soul, 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 brother, 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 I can tell a acapella, and it sounds good to me. There's a sound in my neighborhood, and it's sounding mighty good. There's some guys the lights, and again tonight. I'm from uh, Apopka, Florida. Joe is from North Carolina. Yeah. Jay is from Detroit, Michigan. Jimmy. I'm from Hopewell, Virginia. And uh, we got together in Brooklyn. So the Persuasions was born in Brooklyn. Right. That's where the Persuasions was born. So Brooklyn has that special feel for us. <laughs> you know, when we first realized we were the persuasions, we were in a car one night and uh, we was talking about leaving our jobs and that was a big move because we all had families and we sat in that car to get our heads together and I don't know, something magic happened. Something happened. The car started doing like this. Uh, Jerry looked and see if I had my foot on the thing, on the, on the accelerator. You know, Joe said, what's the matter with your car? And the tears started coming out of his, his eyes. And when we got out the car, we were the persuasions. Especially after Jimmy told us he had a name for us. He said the name of our group is going to be the persuasions because Christ had to persuade people to follow the religion, and we're going to have to persuade people to get behind us, to listen to us sing without a band. <laughs> I can even take my hat off. I got my hat on. That name, Persuasion, is just like you're calling me Jerry Lawson. You know, you can call me Jerry Lawson, or you can call me Persuasion. I'll answer it either one of them. When we started out, there were, there were, there were just one acapella group. I'm yeah, telling now you. it's 367 Whoa, groups. Gra- that many? In the United States. Oh, my gracious, And man. think about this. What? We still ain't got no band. <laughs> oh man, that's wild. Uh, we still ain't got no band. We still ain't got no band. We've been making music all these years and we still ain't got no band. Still, still ain't, ain't got, got no band. band. Still, still ain't got, got no band. band. Making music all these years and we still, still ain't got, got no band. band. Say it again. Still, still ain't got, got no band. band. Oh, still, still ain't got, got no band. band. We've been making, making music all these years, years and we still ain't got, got no band. band. Listen, we when we started, people told us, he said, you know what y'all saying? Say what? They call it acapella. Acapella is an Italian word that means singing without the accompaniment of musical instruments. That's the robin that's outside of your window in the morning chirping. That's acapella. You know, we used to we used to go to a lot of different places looking for that echo, for that sound so that we can hear how we sound. Well, one of our favorite uh, places to rehearse was the uh, subway station at Lafayette Avenue. The echo chamber in that Lafayette, Lafayette station was the best. We used to have our night. Me, Jay, Jimmy, and two boys. Joe, some other guys. We were singing all these. Days. And today, when I play my old 45s, I remember we. Well, people didn't think that we uh, could succeed by singing a cappella because they have never had never heard of anyone else doing it before. The response from the public was, you guys are great, but, it was always but, 
and the but was, you need a band. We defied everything that all the negative stuff that people, you know, threw toward us. And we just kept on trucking. We knew that we were good. We knew that we could sing. And we went out there and that harmony just turned the place upside down. I'm gonna need somebody like Jim was saying before, they always said, but we didn't say but. We just kept on going. We supported each other. That's why we're here today. If there's a dream that you have or a goal or something that you want to accomplish, then what you got to do, you just got to stick with it. Uh, it's going to be people that's going to say things to discourage you. It's going to be people that will do things to discourage you. You're going to fall down, but the dream is more important. That's why you're going to be able to get up again. You're not going to let anyone keep you down. Yeah, the persuasions are living proof that dreams do come true. And uh, if you stick with your convictions and whatever your talents are, you stick with them and they will come true. too much off the top, okay? How long I been cutting your hair? You gave me my first haircut. Case closed. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever wanted to do anything else, Mr. Johnson? I mean, besides cut hair? No, this was my dream, because I never would have been able to pull it off hadn't been for my daddy backing me up. He's the one who told me, go to school and learn how to cut hair. And then he was brave enough to be my first customer. <laughs> <laughs> so it was your father who helped you reach your goal? That's right. Well, in my case, it was my mother. Hmm. You know, when I first decided to become an actor and go to school, there were a mm -hmm. lot of folks in my life who thought it wasn't a good idea. They said, you know, the business is so competitive that I'd probably never make it. Mm -hmm. But my mom was always there with support. She said, if it's something you really want for yourself, LeVar, you go for it. She even helped me by taking on a second job so that I could pay for books and living expenses. You know, sometimes we all need help getting where we want to go. And if there's somebody willing to lend you a helping hand, you reach out and take it. This is Erin Alvarez. She gets her helping hand from Rika Dottavio. Through their friendship and Rika's guidance, Erin has been able to pursue her dream of becoming a veterinarian. I really love horses. They're a big part of my life. If it weren't for Rika, I wouldn't have learned as much as I learned about horses. I think the most important thing that I give to Erin is my time and, and my oh, teaching. Hi, hey, Brady girl. Hi, honey. And that's the thing that's really rewarding. OK, want to check her eyes? Um, yeah, I have. They seem to be staying clear. Good. Good. I you take her advice all the time any, because I know it'll be normal. right. Her eyes will probably show distress first. Her mm -hmm. eyes, her temperature. If she doesn't know the answer to something, she'll tell me, and we'll both take time and look it up. So why would a horse get that on their eye? Well, it could be many causes. I know some folks are born with the condition. Rika's taught me a lot of things that I wouldn't have known about horses. Even, like, the littlest thing, she'll explain it to me. I don't know if that's an evolution She's thing. taught me about the anatomy of a horse, and she took it. a lot of time to teach me about that. Well, they're actually age spots. Mm -hmm. Right at the very top of her teeth, you can see the circles. Mm -hmm. And they all indicate different ages. 
Let me squeeze you. There you go, Sprite Squeezy. girl. Oh, Bring it good, out. good. All right. I would love to oh become God. a vet to work with horses and really any other animal, uh, rather like large animals. And I think the feeling of knowing that I helped to save a horse's life or I did something for it would feel really good. Stick your fingers back in here. You and learn go. by doing. Back and forth so you, can feel one of those veins. you learn by watching and noticing place, everything you know, that, that the horses do. When you can pick up immediately when a horse is distressed, it's it's a talent. You heard it, right? Digestive noise. When I first came here and started talking to Rika, I found out that we had a lot of past experiences that were the same. She's living what I already went through. We started out about the, about the same age, and she had somebody to help her and guide her through everything. I don't think I would be where I am today if it weren't for the person that helped me out. And now in return she wants to help me. I don't think my life would be the same if I hadn't been here, you know, because I, sp I spend so much time here. She's here almost every single day. She's here at the drop of a hat when I need her. And she, she does it all. Her willingness to learn more stuff is, is, shows me how much dedication she has. I see myself in her all the time. In everything that she does, I see myself in her all the time. It's like a bonding. It, it really is like a bonding. Rika and I have a very good relationship, like if I ever need something, she'll be there or I'll be there for her and we can always talk to each other and we're, we're never, we never hold back. It's a big part of my life being able to help someone because I was helped so much in the past with the horses. I really would like to see her do the same one day. When you're reaching for a goal, there are lots of places for you to find inspiration, like family, friends, or a good book. So here are three stories that might just boost your determination to succeed, but you don't have to take my word for it. Hello, I'm Nakandra, and I would like to share with you a wonderful story called Zora Hurston and the Chinaberry Tree. Zora Hurston loves the Chinaberry Tree. Her mother teaches her to climb it, one branch at a time. Her dad says climbing trees is for boys. But Zora only listens to her mom. One day, Zora's mom gets sick. In the end, Zora's mom dies. And although it's very sad, the story actually has a happy ending. I think this is a good book. So remember, Zora Hurston and the China Berry Tree, the next time you need a little inspiration. Hello, my name is David Harris. I just read a book about a man who fulfilled his dream in a mighty way. His name is Alvin Ailey, and that's the name of this book. Alvin's mother worked long hours, and Alvin had to spend a lot of time alone. He met Tad Crone one day, a day that would change his life. Tad and Alvin watched through the stage door. They saw Catherine Dunham and her dancers swirling around. Alvin started to move, and when he danced, happiness glowed inside of him. He worked 
very hard. Alvin's hard work paid off. He moved to New York and started his own dance company, the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. I recommend this book to anyone who has a dream. Read Alvin Ailey and you'll be encouraged to keep on going no matter what. Hi, I'm Sophia. A peddler's dream is a very touching story. It's about one man's big dream that comes true. The story starts when Solomon comes to America. He becomes a peddler. He goes from house to house selling things. But he dreams of having his own store someday. Solomon is a hard worker. It takes a long time, but his dream comes true. A peddler's dream shows that you should never give up. I was happy when Solomon got his dream. I think you will like this story as much as I did. Having a dream is important. It gives you something to reach for. The road isn't always easy, and sometimes there are detours along the way. But if you give it the very best you know how and never lose sight of your goal, I believe dreams can and do come true. Looks good, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> it always does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not today, LeVar. Uh-uh. This one's on me. Really? <laughs> well, how come? I don't know how come. Because I feel like it. <laughs> hey, are you hungry? I'm always hungry. Well, then today, lunch is on me. Because I feel like it. <laughs> All right, then. All right. And you wouldn't think about going to that pizza place on the corner, were you? Because they're always burning the onions. Actually, I was thinking more about that hot dog stand at the bus station. What? Oh, come on. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll see you next time. You better be. Today's Reading Rainbow books are Uncle Jed's Barbershop by Marguerite King Mitchell, illustrated by James Ransom, published by Simon & Schuster Books for Young Readers. Zora Hurston and the Chinaberry Tree, written by William Miller, illustrated by Cornelius Van Wright and Ying Wa Hu, published by Lee and Low Books. Alvin Ailey by Andrea Davis Pinckney. Illustrated by Brian Pinckney. Published by Hyperion Books for Children. A Peddler's Dream by Janice Shuffleman. Illustrated by Tom Shuffleman. Published by Houghton Mifflin Company. The Children's Place is proud to support Reading Rainbow. A place to grow. The Children's Place. Reading Rainbow is also made possible by a ready-to-learn television cooperative agreement from the U.S. Department of Education through the Public Broadcasting Service and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. PBS!